Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, uh, depending on your time zone. And welcome to today's webinar, FISMA, More Than Just a Regulatory Program. My name's Amy. I'm a member of the marketing team here at the Perry Johnson Companies, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar and offer technical support to our speakers. Um, today, we're welcoming not only Chris Reno, a member of the PGRFSI team, to the session, but uh, Jennifer Crandall as well. And that's a, it's a name that should be familiar if you've attended some of our webinars before. Jen is the founder and CEO of Safe Food and Root. Um, but just before we get started, I want to remind all of our attendees that you'll be on mute for the duration of the session just to ensure audio quality. Um, however, we absolutely do want to take any questions that you might have regarding the material discussed. Um, some of the most common questions we get are regarding the slides and um, a, a recording of the broadcast. And I'm happy to say that our slides will be available for download from the PGRFSI website after the presentation. And we are indeed recording the session so that anyone who is in, unable to join us or, you know, maybe have to leave early, somebody missed the first half, um, you know, you'll be able to rewatch with the voiceover and the complete Q&A free of charge on our YouTube channel. Um, just give us about 24 to 48 hours to get that uploaded and they will be available for you to review. Just really quick, I wanted to show you guys how to ask questions of our uh, distinguished panel here. And that's going to be through the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. If you click the little triangle on the left hand side, it should drop down and open up two boxes like this. Just type your question into the lower box and click the send button and we'll get that question on our side and we'll get that answered for you as best we can at the end of the presentation. And now just before we get started with uh, Jen and her slides, I wanted to give you all a polling question just to get the conversation started. So that should be showing up on your screen now. And that question is, how mature is your food safety program? Um, you know, maybe you already have a GFSI program in place with passing scores. Maybe you have a GFS, GFSI system, but you need some help with, you know, corrective actions, process improvement. Um, you know, maybe you've been inspected by some regulatory agency and you passed. Uh, maybe you've been inspected and had a warning or a near miss, um, or maybe you know, you've never been inspected and you're not really sure where to begin. Um, so just, there's no correct answer. All answers are anonymous. We just want to get a feel for who all is in the audience today and how we can best shape the presentation to your needs and interests. So we'll leave this up for another 30 seconds. So far, we're looking pretty even. We've got a an even split of into quarters here between the first four answers, but I am glad to see that we at least all have some interaction with inspections or a GFSI system. So we'll just give this another couple of seconds just to get some last stragglers in, and then we'll get started with Jennifer. All right, thank you all for voting. If you had any questions pursuant to these uh, response options, please, as I said before, put those into the questions tab. We are happy to discuss all of those at, uh, at greater length at the end of the, pro the prepared slides. All right, I'm gonna just go ahead and put the responses up on the screen. As I said, pretty even split. Uh, the only neglected option is uh, not, not ever having been inspected or not had knowing where to start with inspection or uh, GFSI systems. And with that, Jen, I'm going to hand things over to you with the beginning of your slides here and Chris as well. Thank you all um, both for joining us today and we look forward to hearing some uh, interesting discussion between the two of you. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. All right. Uh, I guess it's, it's handed over to me, correct? So I guess I'll jump in and um, start. So thank you again to uh, the PGR community. We're super happy to be here. I, I love uh, doing the webinars with your team and, and get to interact with your audience. I really appreciate the time. Um, just a quick reminder of my background for those that are not familiar with me. Uh, I do have over 20 years of experience in the industry. Actually, I'm hitting that 24, so I can probably start saying 24 at this stage. Uh, eight years in manufacturing experience. Uh, so I did um, different roles, and this was before FISMA requirements. This was before GFSI requirements, so I was pretty new to a lot of those systems. Um, I was in production supervision. I was a buyer planner at times or a fill-in for the buyer planner at the, at the facilities. Um, I was always in management roles. I did spend most of my time in manufacturing and quality assurance and little dabble in research and development. Um, most of that time, you know, 
very familiar with writing a HACCP plan, not necessarily, again, not FSMA, but HACCP I was familiar with and all of the supporting prerequisite programs. Um, so I'm dating myself because I graduated from Purdue in 98. So it just, were not, they were not the requirements yet. Um, from there, I moved into corporate experience. So I worked at corporate Kroger for 12 years. And um, nine out of 12 of those years, I was spending time in the corporate food technology department, helping them with managing supplier compliance and doing private label uh, oversight of different categories of foods. Um, I spent a lot of time do, actually holding all of the supply chain at Kroger um, accountable to the GFSI requirements that they had at the time for their um, supplier requirements. So a lot of that time spent doing vetting suppliers in all areas of compliance and understanding direct imports. I did get to spend, I call it, so I said nine years in corporate food technology. I also spent three years as my detour, I call it the three-year detour in global sourcing. So I was able to learn a lot more about the business side of purchasing and managing logistics and understanding the global supply chain. Um, from there, the FSBP, rule really was um it, it went into effect and we started as an industry understanding more about the fsbp rule and because of the global background plus the supplier compliance background uh, i went back into a role that was very much uh surrounded by fsbp requirements so um, i spent a couple of years in that role and then through many 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 conversations with a lot of the importing community uh, I did recognize uh, an opportunity, so I took a jump to start Safe Food and Root. Um, so I founded that in 2018. And on the, I think on the next slide, I, I explain a little bit of the services so that you can understand. We did our tried and true for the services that Safe Food and Root had, um, has now currently. Are, uh, we do FSBP compliance and uh, more of that supplier compliance management solution. So we're very grounded in that. I understand how to work in that very well. And that segues into the second bullet where we um, do assist a lot of our clients with Repositrack implementation and consult to that. Um, so Repositrack being another software, we use them as one of our partners to be able to assist our clients to be able to manage their documents. Um, and, and we consult to the solutions that are built around like corporate compliance programs. So that's what we our mantra is we um, are making corporate corporate food safety systems accessible to everyone. Um, we also, because of high demand, we're started to get re a lot of requests for food safety consulting programs to be assisted in those categories. So we started to um, assist clients in helping them build up their regulatory programs if they were trying to just meet regulatory compliance requirements in FDA. Uh, sometimes in USDA buckets as well. Um, and then we also, anybody that was looking at trying to build up to a third party audit or a GFSI scheme requirement. And the last bucket that we play in, the space that we play in is diligence assessments for food safety. So sometimes we are involved in uh, pre or post transaction activities that help with uh, private equity companies to understand the risks and get uh, a good insight into what they're stepping into with the relationship of purchases. And when we step into those uh, environments, we're usually assisting another partner of ours uh, on the West Coast to be able to assist them with their process. Um, and they do a full diligence assessment as well. So we are part of their food safety team. Um, and so those are our services at this stage. And um, I know Chris uh, probably needs to do an introduction as well. So I took the stage away from you. I apologize. So if you want to. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's fantastic. Um, you know, obviously lots of background. Um, you know, I guess just really quickly, um, looking at your background, I did have a question. So coming from the corporate QA world, what was some of the reasons that caused you to really kind of start off and found your business? and, and what really led you down that path? You know, did you see things in the industry that you felt like, you know, you can make a positive impact on? Or was there something specific in your career where, you know, was that defining moment for you? Yeah, uh, um, that's a great question. And thank you for asking that. Um, so when I was in corporate, so first off, the eight years in manufacturing. So I should maybe go back to the eight years, uh, Mark. Um, two out of the first two were at one of the Kroger plants 
and the next two were out of Safeway plants. Uh, so I got that experience of that corporate, um, you know, like just organizational structure and how they support their companies. Well, then I moved into two privately held companies where I was one of the higher QA uh, people in the company. And so it was relying very heavily on me. Well, understanding that this is in my first 10 years of my career, uh, the first eight years to be concise, I really did not know as much as I needed to, to be in roles like that. But um, the affordability of my salary, and, and this is just reality of the industry, right? So the affordability for the smaller and mid-sized companies to be able to hire somebody that has 10, 15, 20 years experience that's written programs that understands all of the requirements, it's harder for them to be able to budget that. And so I was probably fitting a budget need at the time um, with limited experience. What I didn't understand at that time uh, is to, you know, tapping into my network of, of people, but my network were the first four years of my career, which were in companies that I left. <laughs> so I didn't have that network. Um, so knowing that and then going into the corporate environment and starting to have all of these discussions with, I mean, I've, I've probably spoken to thousands of companies and hearing their stories and how they started and then where they are, where they have people exactly the same shoes that I really felt like I was in at, you know, at my four year mark, at my six year mark in my career. Um, and so I, know, I knew that those people probably didn't have all of the resources and tools and network to be able to achieve really good food safety and quality programs. And um, so when GFSI requirements went into place and Kroger started holding all of their people accountable to it, all their suppliers to it, um, that increased the conversations and it did help, I feel like it did help elevate the supply community. A lot of the other retailers were holding the same um, requirements. So they were also putting those requirements into effect of SQF, BRC, um, and some of all the accredited schemes at the time. Um, so, I saw that evolution happening. What I didn't know uh, by the end of my career, like when the FISMA requirements went into effect, I did I wasn't sure how aware everyone was of it. And when I started having those conversations with the importing community specifically, the FSVP requirements were so new. And so that like that led to that, okay, there's a definite need. I can I can only do so much in my position here because my role was not dedicated to assist every supplier um, that worked with Kroger to meet their, achieve their requirements. So it was like, I have to take a leap to be able to help them. So that's where, that's where it really started. It was grounded in, in just my personal career and it reflecting on it. So That's great. And, you know, you talked obviously very briefly on, um, you know, some of the products and services that you guys offer. And one of the words that I heard you use was marketability. So um, I guess just really quickly, if you could kind of talk about, um, you know, that aspect with, you know, like um, some of these programs like um, HACCP or preventative controls, for instance, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how companies can use these certificates and being proactive with these certificates and how that kind of translates into the marketability of the company? Absolutely. Well, and I mean, the, the foundation of the question, you know, from, from the regulatory requirement, Depending on which food uh, item that you're producing, you are you're probably required to have a HACCP program, or you might have to have a preventive controls uh, food safety plan in place. Um, so, from marketability standpoint, that's already a requirement by law. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of your customers, if you're selling to the um, distribution channels, to the wholesalers, to the to the retail customers they already require that you meet this. Like you have a contract in place that says, I agree to meet all of the regulatory requirements that are in place for my type of product. Um, but also just keep in mind that the it, this is also for brand protection. So everyone that eats food expects their food um, when they consume it, that it's gonna be safe, or at least they hope so. I think uh, personally, I'm seeing in just my circles, a lot of, consumers losing confidence in our food safety supply because um, of all the recall events and that sort of thing. So they're seeing it all the time. They're flooded and they're just have less trust and less confidence in our food safety programs. But the main goal that I think everybody has in general is to produce wholesome quality product for companies. That means that 
food safety is top of mind. So that's that's one. That's just like basic brand protection. Then you have the large retailers and wholesalers are asking it. I mentioned that for contractual requirements. Um, they also ask that added layer a lot of times of the third party audits or supply chain. The reason they're asking for that additional requirement a lot of times is because they're managing so much volume. I mentioned that I spent time like talking to thousands of suppliers. Well, I, tracking all of their third party food safety audit statuses was quite an undertaking. So being able to rely on a program like GFSI really assisted me in being able to manage that high volume of information. Um, so that's another reason that they do that. But the, you know, they're doing, the, the retailers and the wholesalers are doing that for brand protection as well. So they're trying to protect their brand. So it's always a kind of a, you know, that ultimate barrier of like, we want to have, we want to have products on our shelves that our customers have confidence in that they trust. Um, and then the third benefit um, that I want to mention, and it's, it seems like it's not um, really a benefit because it also means a little bit of an expense, but a lot of companies, most Retailers, most wholesalers require that you carry some type of insurance to help uh, cover if you have an incident of a recall or something like that. If you have that, um, similar to car insurance, the less incidents you have, the more proactive your programs are, the safer you drive, you know, the, the, you're going to get lower rates. So sometimes the companies are looking at that risk level and making sure that you have limited risk. Um, and, you know, I can't. I can't speak about um, insurance without speaking about the current situation that probably a lot of people are aware of that are on this call um, with the um, with the GIF uh, peanut butter recall that's currently going on and it continues to expand. Um, and programs like that, like GIF's a well-known brand, obviously they most likely have you know programs in place. So HACCP, preventive controls, they can't fix everything. They're, they're, things are gonna get missed, things are gonna happen. Um, but in, I, to me, like the most important thing for marketability purposes is the more that you invest in your food safety programs and keep them first in line, the more you're going to be able to gain that confidence of your team, your customers, and the consumers of your products. This is a big reason why food safety culture is such a hot topic. Um, you know, it's top down, it's down up. Um, you know, making sure that it should be a part of every discussion and regular regulations are just the stepping stone to that culture. That's a that's an absolutely great answer. Thank you for, you know, expanding on that so much. So um, I, I guess to follow up with that, so when we're talking about FISMA and the GFSI based programs, um, I, you know, obviously this is our world. I know we're in this every day. Um, I, I, I do know that there's a lot of similarities, you know, within the two standards and, you know, with the schemes and some of the rules and regulations. Can mm -hmm. you just, I guess, touch very briefly on some of the similarities that, you know, do have a lot of crossover between the two and, and how they kind of build upon one another? Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and on the slide that's shown, I mean, I just cover a couple of topics of hazard assessment, the risk analysis. Um, these are these are basic foundational things, so I don't want to um, undermine. I, I kind of wanted to just give you an idea of some of the things that are commonly asked for, but these are just a few that come to mind. Um, truly understanding your suppliers and doing a thorough risk analysis of the product is part of GFSI requirements. It's know your supplier, know your products. It's the same with HACCP. It's the same with FISMA requirements. Understanding the hazards that are associated with the product mitigating those risks right so lately um i i, I want to share um so in my community in my immediate network and a shout out to a few people that probably uh, will be excited about it um there there are some people in the food safety consulting space that currently are are having a lot of controversy around global food safety initiative the gfsi requirements um feeling like that is a distraction to the the companies that are getting audited because there's a lot of paperwork and checking off the boxes. And it's also can get very, um, you know, just like people get kind of in autopilot with it. So it becomes less of a proactive program and more of a program that's meant to, like I said, check off boxes. Um, yeah, very lot, reactionary. Absolutely, absolutely. But a lot of those, um, 
you know, requirements are there. The, you know, the Food Safety Modernization Act, the FISMA requirements, they're built into the elements that are written into the guidances for GFSI requirements as well. Um, for those scheme owners and, and the GFSI benchmarking process already had a lot of it in there. So in fact, um, there were a lot of conversations early and I'm sure the PGR community is more familiar with it than I am. Um, but there, you know, there was discussions, there's FISMA addendums that are added where it's just the few things that are missing that are in the FISMA requirements for the U.S. versus what's actually in the GFSI requirements. And they're very small addendums to the audit schemes because the audit schemes are so robust and cover so many different elements. So they have that. Um, also, you know, I mentioned before, many large retailers and wholesalers rely on that third party process to ensure that they're meeting the requirements. So there was there was, I don't know what's going on currently. I think it went silent. There was discussions between the FDA um, and GFSI, like giving, um, you know, understanding that they can use GFSI as part of their requirements to say that they actually meet the preventive controls rule at least, um, if not some of the other requirements as well, like the sanitary transportation rule and FSVP and stuff like that. Um, for startup and early stage companies though, I mean, GFSI requirements, even regulatory requirements can be really challenging. So um, trying to help those smaller companies uh, see these tools, these different elements that are important that are built into your program is really important and giving them, um, there are audit schemes that are out there available like the um, Harmonized Gap Audit and a couple of others or supplier assurance audits, even the larger companies like Costco and, and Trader Joe's and uh, Whole Foods, they all do different requirements that have, like incrementally help those smaller companies get to a higher food safety program, a more robust food safety program. That's great. So, you know, you, you talked um, about these here on the screen. So one of the questions that I have, and you, you know, you're talking about your network a little bit of food safety professionals and friends in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just got back from a trade show last week, and one of the questions that it seemed to be um, somewhat recurring, right, because when you're talking with Q&A people, they always want to be able to control everything. You know, you want to know exactly where all these pitfalls are, and then once you really start applying FISMA and looking further downstream at your suppliers, where do you see some of the more common pitfalls, you know, whether it's your based on your past experience with, you know, your Kroger suppliers or just, you know, in your consulting, you know, day-to-day -day life now, where are you seeing some of the more common pitfalls with these programs? Yeah, the, a, a lot still is top-down. Um, I think that companies miss the boat on um, really building food safety into their culture of their companies. So it's a top-down priority. Um, think of the way that this appears, the way that that kind of surfaces whenever you're walking into a facility or you're looking at their programs, you can tell that um, if a leader walks through a company and has jewelry on, it, it sends a very clear message to the entire company, to the, all the manufacturing plants that they don't care about basic food safety hygiene. If the leader of the company does not care about basic food safety hygiene, then why would anyone else care about it that much either? Like, you don't you don't care enough to be an example to me. That's one area that like I see repeat over and over and over again. They're all they're depending on the reason for the entry to the facility. Um, you know, it might be uh, they're they're excited because they're showing it off, or they're uh, walking through and they're just you know I'm j I'm just walking in and walking right back out. Like I'm I'm working in a, a, a office space and I don't have any kind of, you know, I'm not touching the food or anything like that. So they, in, in their minds, they justify it, but it is, it's the example. It's a behavioral issue that they're not paying attention to. And the, the other things that I will say uh, is that same mentality carries over into the business plans. So um, if the leaders are not building this into the business plans and they're not allowing their food safety quality leaders to be able to get the assistance that they need or encouraging them to go get the assistance that they need to meet customer requirements and demand, um, then they're, they're basically bottlenecking their own company. Um, with uh, like, I, I said it earlier and I was kind of saving it till this question because I knew this question was coming. 
Um, but for like the, for the food safety quality leaders that are out there, you know, I mentioned my first uh, four to eight years of my experience, I was in your shoes. I did not know how to tap into my network. I didn't have a strong network. All I had was my degree uh, and I would go back a lot and use my network at Purdue, which I, where, where I graduated from. So Purdue Food Science has a really strong network. So I was able to go back to them and then they would pull me back into industry associations and that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I still didn't have a huge network. What I will say is don't be afraid to go to the small network if you feel like you have a small network um, or some of the industry associations that maybe your um, company is a part of because the resources are there. There's a lot of resources in that community that are available and um, you know, you really can get a lot out of using those people. There's a lot of people that are willing to help. Or the, any leaders that are in this, uh, non-food safety, but like the general manager, or plant manager, owners, and that sort of thing, being sure that you're including it in your business plans, like really writing food safety into it. Um, it's not cheap to have good food safety management programs. You may not have the budget to have a full-time staff member dedicated to it. Um, so if you have to hire people that are a little less experienced, be prepared to use other resources to be able to help build your programs. Um, some of that can cost tens, you know, consulting can cost tens and thousands of dollars. So you have to think about that if you want to grow. And, you know, again, you're bottlenecking your business if you don't grow these. Um, if you're cutting costs at the expense of food safety, it will eventually bottleneck you because you won't be able to uh, bid for a product with one of the major retailers if there's some kind of program that they're expecting you to be certified to. Um, including room for consulting to come in, assist build your programs, that's really valuable. Uh, investing in your team and training them to make sure that they have the required training to be able to support those programs and build them into sustainable programs that are company-wide culture. Um, and then the other thing that I think is often overlooked is it, there are tools, different types of tools, automation, um, you know, like make it easy for your whole food safety quality team to have success. And sometimes that means like going back to some of the controversy about GFSI is that it's so much paperwork. There's just so many, I mean, like yeah. for, I think for SQF alone, you need like a hundred different documents designed and that's not including the operational forms that you're filling out daily and adding to that list. And when you have that kind of paperwork trail, it's very hard to manage. And especially mm -hmm. if you're a small lean team. So invest in tools that help automate those processes that can build out a quality management program that can, um, you know, take data from the line and immediately put it into a digital form that can be able to give the whoever the PCQI is the opportunity to sign off on it electronically where they can read it quickly. They can read more real time data instead of yesterday's data or mm -hmm. seven days ago data um, because you can't react either. That's again going back into the reactive proactive programs. You're reacting if you're reading it a day late. You can be proactive and have programs and processes built into it where your critical limits are built into the software programs. So, you know, having allowable critical limits is part of HACCP. That's part of the requirements. That's part of preventive controls. So giving them those types of tools and being able to give your, your team that is really important. So I'm hopeful that the audience that is here will be able to um, apply some of those concepts into their business plans specifically because I think it is part of your mission statement. It's part of your overall um, strategy to build up your food safety quality programs. Well, and again, I think you said something and, you know, to kind of go back to it, but it's when you're investing in your tools and you're training your people, you're also empowering them, right? To, and that really kind of comes back to the, the, you know, quality of the culture uh, of the organization. You know, you see people that aren't afraid to step out of their lane just a little bit at, you know, see something, kind of say something mentality of, you know, hey, this doesn't look right. Let's take a step back. And, you know, I think, again, that just kind of comes back to the maturity of the systems in place and, you know, how well that they're trained to know that they do have that ability, you know, to, to bring those things to the attention of their supervisors and leaders in the organizations. Great, Definitely. great answer. Thank you.
Um, let's see. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So from, uh, I, I know this is the pre-planned questions that we had going into this. So I know we'll be um, entertaining questions in the audience as well. But for anyone that wants to learn more about Safe Food and Root or get our assistance, um, please contact TV Yasin Damarin. Um, she's our Director of Business Development. I have all of her contact information here. Or you can go to our website and find, you can, if you, if you already know what you need or want, uh, there's a sales uh, consult form on there as well on that website that you could go in and fill out and we'll get in touch with you right away. So. So um, I've got a I've got a really good question actually we've got an auditor on here that just sent me something just on my on my personal phone so I wanted to go ahead and ask this question really quickly um, can you talk about the COVID impacts on you know maybe the FISMA and FSBP program and kind of what you've seen you know pre-COVID maybe some of the changes that you know we're seeing now in this somewhat post-COVID world that we're living in. Yeah, I mean, it's so it's so much of the norm now that I'm having a hard time distincting before COVID. Right, uh, pre and post, you know, what are those days, yeah. Right. Like, I, don't, I don't know the difference anymore because things have changed so much. But I will say in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we, of, of course, the supply chain side of the, um, you know, food safety sector, I mean, all of that, it affected our our processes, right? So like we we had to stop and start at different times. We may have had to do more runs to try to fill the um, delivery shortages that we might have had in our customers because of over purchasing. And that probably, um, I like personally what I saw what I saw from the FSBP side of it. FSBP really didn't stop. Um, so we had a lot of activity on the FSBP side. We actually had a lot of activity on the diligence side too. There was a lot of purchasing in 2021 um, from the private equity space. So we had a lot of activity there. From the consulting side, it was dependent, like can you do desktop work instead of going into plants? Because that was during COVID, you weren't allowed to go in. We're just starting to be allowed to go into facilities again to do on-site consulting. Um, and sometimes you're required a mask, sometimes you're not. Now with the CDC guidance currently saying you don't have to wear a mask, um, you know, and at least on public transportation. So now the airlines are completely backed up. So we're also seeing a lot of movement again and trade shows are opening back up. So I'm seeing a lot of that type of activity. As far as HACCP, FISMA, GFSI, I mean, the, the brand owners still want all of those requirements met. So I have not seen a slowdown necessarily. We continue to wrap up uh, in the consulting space. And my assumption is that the auditing companies are still, well, and you probably could speak to this being a, you know, a certified body that you're probably still having some of the scheduling issues, right? Where it's trying to get everybody re-audited and audits were delayed. So from an FSBP side of it or supplier compliance program, we've had to have a lot of grace to audits that missed their expiration dates, had to go in for expirations and, and that sort of thing. So it did create a little bit of like hiccups in that um, space as well. Uh, post COVID, I mean, it's picking back up. So <laughs> uh, now we're seeing more. Uh, and one thing I did notice, I mentioned this on a webinar uh, probably about four months ago that there was a lot of, and I still see it, a lot of recalls that are coming out with foreign material. Um, so some are microbes. So we're starting to see microbes come up again, pathogens and that sort of thing. And I mentioned the GIF one with the salmonella recall. Um, but prior to that, there was a lot of foreign material. And so it's like, well, where's the breakdown happening in the processes that is allowing a lot of uh, for material and I have a lot of theories of what it might be but I haven't seen a lot of data to support it so I'm not going to waste time sharing all of my theories but um, I, I thought that was interesting that there was more recalls associated with foreign material than I'd seen in a long time. Um, metal was showing up a lot, glass was showing up. Uh, I didn't see plastic parts but I know there you know I'm, like I didn't see recalls that were on the news publicly with plastic or rubber um, but I I knew about a few incidents that happened that were more private. So um, I, I just, to me, that was an interesting thing. So I'm hoping that we, like, we're seeing more regulatory inspections again. So we'll probably start seeing more recalls uh, for a period of time because there was also that pause. 
uh, and oversight. That's great. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I know we've got some questions that are coming in for the audience. Um, I'm going to bring Amy back on really quickly to facilitate some of the questions. Um, and then we'll just kind of get right into our QA here. Okay. Absolutely, guys. Um, really quick, I did want to encourage everybody again, if you haven't already, drop any of those questions you might have thought of um, during the slides or the discussion, put them right in that questions tab. And I'm going to really quickly just touch on our next upcoming webinar, um, another returning speaker that everyone should be familiar with, and this is not one you want to miss. Um, Dr. Spink is an amazing speaker, uh, great presenter, and I'm sure this topic, food fraud, the permanent impacts of COVID and Ukraine-Russia, um, is going to be something that everybody can learn from. Um, and that's going to be on June 8th. Uh, so you know, just over a week away. Um, and that's going to be at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a little bit different from our usual webinar timing, um, but you can go to pgfsi.com slash webinars um, to read the full description of what we're going to cover and register for free. All of our webinars are complimentary, so we hope to see you there. All right, but really quick, I did want to go then into some Q&A. And Jen, I have to encourage you out that this is absolutely the place for you to tell us your theories <laughs> about, <laughs> you know, for, foreign object contamination and whatnot. Yeah. I know, um, I, got my, I had my pen, I was ready for oh, some insights and everything. Like, I was ready right. for it. But... Well, right. I can hear it, it's just it's recorded, and I don't know if it's accurate or not. So, like, sometimes it sounds conspiracy side. Well, but... well instead, okay, well, we'll put the tinfoil hats away then. Um, instead of Speaking on that, could you maybe talk a little bit about what you see as the future of FISMA, you know, five, ten years down the road? As, you know, you mentioned, you know, coming into the post-COVID world, uh, like, wh where do you see FISMA going? Do you see it developing in a certain direction? Or, you know, do you see maybe there there will be a need for a successor somewhere along the line? Oh, no, I mean, I think FISMA will continue to roll out the way it has been. It's been more of a um, educate than regulate. Um, process. I had, I sat in on a, a webinar early on uh, after I started the business that an attorney that was specialized in FDA talked about it a little bit and he mentioned um, what he was seeing and I have asked, he's been 100% right to this point. So I totally see what he was saying. When we had the rollout of uh, seafood HACCP and juice HACCP many, many years ago, it was, um, you know, like, they started inspecting, they had goals, the FDA had goals of how many inspections they were gonna do and they were educating at those times. So they were a little bit more lenient in the way they did their um, warnings, right? So there was a little bit, we saw the exact same thing come out with FSBP. When I started seeing FSBP roll out, I saw the exact same behavior where it was, we're gonna come in and look at your programs. If you don't have anything, uh, it was noted on the FDA side, but they didn't technically get a warning. They were just, that was kind of like a, I don't want to say it was an NAI, but it was more like a VAI, right? A voluntary action indicated. Um, and then you didn't have to report it. So then the reinspections have started. So I did notice reinspections in 2020 and in 2019, more specifically 2019 before the pandemic, I was seeing repeat inspections. So they started doing inspections in, uh, I believe, 2017 and 2018 in FSBP space. And they, so they started doing repeat inspections of those companies along with increasing their metrics. So we still see, and I, somebody mentioned uh, the other day on a webinar, and I don't remember which one it was. <laughs> I attend a lot of different things. Uh, but somebody mentioned the, the numbers that the FDA was trying to hit on their inspection rate. So they have a certain number that are in re-inspections. There are a certain number that are going to be new inspections, never been inspected before. And then they were also increasing the categories that they were inspecting. So now I've started seeing dietary supplement companies get more inspections. I'm seeing uh, the produce sector get a little bit, animal feed get a little bit on, and this is FSBP space. Um, preventive controls, they seem to be doing the same thing. So they're expanding their categories. Uh, so they're doing, um, you know, the human food categories that were higher risk early on. Now they're starting to expand into the lower risk categories. Um, they also have started doing more towards animal feed as well. And so I think that's what we'll continue to see for many years. Um, it, based on what my understanding of seafood HACCP and juice HACCP, I was in the industry when, and, and actually was in a juice plant when juice HACCP rolled out. 
And uh, that one was like, I was educating the FDA as much as the FDA was educating me on juice HACCP. So um, I definitely can see uh, that we're doing the same thing. One of the nuances that I noticed with the FDA, and I don't know if they're, if they're still managing it this way, because I, I, I think they are, they were using customs agents FDA customs agents to do the FD, the FSDP inspections. Those team members do not have all of the same backgrounds as somebody that might have been doing inspections at food facilities on, you know, like walkthroughs. So uh, we're, uh, they're learning as much as we are. Um, but you will continue to see increases in um, probably warnings in citations, I, I can guarantee that because their their goal is to increase number of inspections. So um, if their num if numbers are increasing on both sides of that. So that's my Definitely. two cents. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well here, let's make it a nice round four cents. Um, audience okay. question here, um, asking your thoughts on FISMA 204, uh, which will mandate end-to-end -end traceability, including lot code data collection at the SKU level, um, in November this year, um, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's obviously going to impact lots of companies and it might yeah. be a little bit of a surprise. <laughs> yeah, so that's also covering some of those high risk categories uh, as well. And they're mainly focused on produce and ag and like, um, I think they're cheese. I haven't looked at the regulation in a, a minute, but um, yeah, so that one, I think they'll do the same thing, educate as they roll it out. So they'll do inspections on site for probably, you know, when they're there doing preventive controls inspections, they're also mm -hmm. going to look at these traceability programs. Um, for the produce community, they're going to be doing produce safety rule inspections, and they'll probably glance at your traceability programs. And so um, November's coming fast, and I don't think there are enough conversations about that topic currently, and at least in my circles, where there's still distraction from the GFSI conversations, right? So yeah. I'm not I'm not seeing a lot of emphasis now. Um, industry associations are talking about it. You know, you have the um, IFPA that is not. You know, they they're really active watching the traceability rule, um, and so they're trying to make sure that everybody in the IFPA organization is informed and understands what's going on. Uh, but there is definitely a lack of conversation on traceability. I think. Part of that too is that the, there's an assumption, everybody thinks that traceability is something that we're all doing. So when I walk in through facilities, a lot of times like, oh, I've got traceability, it's covered. Well, how is it covered? What are you doing? And yeah, then you through know, a software or right. you know, are you taking notes? Like what does the yeah. data look like? Yeah. Well, and, and day to day, they, they don't have the programs in place they think they do. They, mm -hmm. a lot of times, they don't understand that it's, you know, looking at, well, now the traceability rule is like, tracing back from the the field right so a lot of the the point of origin of that product and the lot code and the volume that, and that has to carry over through all the data so there's a, a big um you know just way of dealing with big data at this stage that i don't think the industry is going to be fully prepared for at all mm -hmm. um so uh, yeah it's probably going to take over by storm i know uh, my repository friends and i talk about it all the time so yeah um, yeah now so speaking of that you know in the traceability kind of recall um practice if you will you know when you're wearing your consulting hat and you're going out and you're seeing clients um you know a lot of times like you said they well we've done our traceability exercise you know here it is we we performed it last summer you know how often should you know um in your opinion how often should these these customers, you know, the manufacturing sites, I, I know that the standard, you know, requires one thing, but it, best practice, you know, coming from you, how often should they be going through those exercises and, and tracking their recall notice and, and performing that mock recall? Yeah, I, well, that's a personal opinion. I mean, one, follow the standard that you're uh, doing, and a lot of them require at least annual. If not, some of them are every six months. Um, I am an athlete in, by nature and background, and I say you, you get what you practice. And if you don't practice at all, ever, then it's going to be a disaster. If you don't know who to call, when to call, who's on the team, 
um, and how to trace the paperwork. It's not just about tracing the paperwork, but it's like notifications. It's um, public, you know, public conversations. It's notifying the regulatory authorities that you're in this event. If you do not practice that and know exactly what to do in the event, it's, I mean, it's just like fire drills, right? So we do fire drills as a kid um, in companies, large companies do fire drills, they do tornado drills, they do, um, you know, un, un, unfortunate other types as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so yeah, you get what you practice. If you do not practice it regularly and you are a small team and you think you can easily find all the paperwork, let me tell you about the story about Jeff because they're getting ready to find out how many places their product is in. and last week it was just the peanut butter in your pantry and this week i'm seeing recalls that are like 10 other products that have a little gif cup in them so you will you will find the reach is a lot bigger than you realize if you do not practice and this is coming from i'm sure like i'm confident in in smuckers and the gif brand that they probably were doing their exercises the way they should so it's unfortunate and I hate to use them as an example, but at the same time, it's a real legitimate example at today um, that they're, that we're experiencing. It's gonna to continue to expand. Um, that's traceability. That's the way it works. That's your recall program. If you do not practice it, it you, will, you will have more and more problems and you'll find out about them and then you'll have to go through ethical questions as a team deciding, do we need to call the customer and tell them more? Do we need, you know, so it's like, don't do that to yourselves. That's stressful. It's ridiculously stressful and unnecessary. Practicing and being proactive and intentional with it, you know, schedule it. it does, that One of my coaches in my previous life um, had told me it won't happen if you don't schedule it. <laughs> so, and that's absolutely true. <laughs> that was not an athletic coach. <laughs> True for all parts of life, I'm sure. Uh, all right. we've, we've got one more question here. Um, if anyone has any more, please send them in. I'm going to put up really quick, uh, well, just one more time, if you didn't catch it, the contact information for Safe Food and Root. Um, absolutely encourage you guys to reach out if you have any questions about what they can offer you, any questions about what they do. Maybe you just have a question you're too shy to ask on the live session, totally fine. Shoot them an email and I'm sure you'll get the answers you're looking for. Uh, but the last question I have down here um, is regarding, maybe inspired by us mentioning our next webinar, uh, in what ways can FSVP help with food fraud issues? Uh, at, well, an FSVP or um, any of the others, um, all of the FISMA rules really go into trying to prevent food fraud and understand it's it's all about know your product, know your suppliers, understand the hazards with your products. If there is authenticity concerns or a potential where you might have adulteration or you might have some kind of fraudulent activity in that category of food, and we already know that it happens, then you have no excuses. It's when you get blindsided by it that you weren't aware, but then having a reactive program in place, um, or, you know, it's, I, I, I like to say proactive and reactive a lot. So I wanna be clear, you have to understand what types of correction, corrective actions you're gonna take in the event of. So you wanna know how you're going to react in that situation a food fraud, you know, policy program, um, or even a supplier compliance program. There, to me, FISMA is very much supportive of very good supplier programs, very good product programs of specifications, understanding all of the different risks and associated with the food, and then making sure that your processes are mitigating those risks. And if your processes are not, it's also very encouraging to make sure that down the road, uh, whoever your customer is understands the risks that they're taking in from you. So if you're selling um, an unprocessed food to somebody who's going to co-mingle it or um, they're not going to apply a kill step, do they understand the risk that they're taking on? Are they willing to take that risk? Do they feel like they need to work with you differently to get that process to prevent it? Food fraud and food authenticity problems continue to hit the industry pretty hard. I mean, we have a lot of categories of food that we understand have food fraud um, regularly. Um, seafood has it all the time. Honey has it all the time. Um, and so being aware and understanding your category of food and not just being a handler of food and saying, 
um, at doing like cross stocking. You have to know more about your products now. The, the law requires that you do. Well, and I think it kind of goes right back to the the title of today's webinar, right? Not just regulatory program. Um, I think so much of this, and you know, again, kind of that proaction versus reaction. I think so much of this, um, you know, kind of brought on with COVID and the lack of visibility in some of your suppliers. You know, I know a lot of a lot of my friends that are internal auditors at companies have complained that, you know, through you know through the today's mediums that we're using whether it's you know webcams or phones a lot of those things you know they've they've found that they have to dive in a lot deeper you know and have a lot more conversations because you know they have in the past just really been using it you know their program as as that check mark right and now right. that they're not able to really get out and see them they found that they had to get more creative and you know ask more questions and you know kind of dive into their suppliers in a different way and you know I, I think it's really interesting um i think you're right it's it's always going to be a problem um food fraud is is always going to be there but the better that you know your suppliers the better you know your chances are that it's not going to be one of your suppliers so right. um, i'm a huge fan of being you know proactive in that regard yeah i totally agree chris and i with with any um any product any process any supply chain management program, the hazard analysis, uh, that's what that's the common denominator. And going into that deep dive with it and actually like I, I when food fraud and when I mean when FISMA still was very early stages on conversations, I was in a manufacturing plant and an inspector from the army came and he blew my mind with some of the questions that he was asking. And I was like, why is he asking that he was like and, and it he was trying to prep me for uh fisma rules that were coming in because this this was like this was before fisma was even rolled out um it mm -hmm. was probably 2002 or 2000 or it was probably 2003 so it was you know post 9 11 and he was talking about biosecurity hazards he was talking about fraud fraud in a sense of like you know, do you know and understand your employees? Doing background checks on your employees uh, is no longer just a, um, you know, some kind of practice that we do from an HR perspective, but it's actually understanding like, do they have criminal background that I am comfortable with hiring them? So I'm not saying, and I, I can't say that, right? Like I can't say who you can and can't hire, but if their criminal background lends them to some type of fraudulent activity, are you comfortable with them coming into your facility and handling your food uh, to your consumer? That army inspector asked me a question. He was like, do you know if your team is down the road talking to somebody at a bar about what you do at this facility? And that person convinces them to take a vial and add it to your food product. And the vial is some kind of hazard. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I thought it was crazy. Uh, but now we're we're writing programs that are related to thinking through that exact scenario. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like all of your security points. Is your plant secure? Can somebody get in and out of it without you being aware of it? If they can, then somebody can do something to your product. But what cracks me up the most is that, uh, you know, we have all of these tools and things in place, but then we don't talk about our fields that are very accessible and all the, the farming community is very accessible to the same things. But, you know, trying to control them in-house in the plant uh, is is just one step. That's just a few examples that I mentioned, but um, that one cracked me up. I, I thought that guy was crazy. Um, and now I look back at him and I'm like, I wish he was on my team. <laughs> you know, right, like, yeah, forward thinker. Forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very forward thinker. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions from the audience, Amy. I know we're getting, um, you know, kind of dangerously close to the end here. So <laughs> I just want to, um, you know, thank you for your time today, Jennifer, um, you know, Heavy, right, right. Amy, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our um, guests that are in attendance for everyone that asked questions. Um, if you have anything, you know, after the webinar, please don't hesitate, reach out directly, um, you know, reach out to AV, myself, um, really anyone on the team here at Safe Food and Root, I know can help you out. So um, thank you so much for your time today, Jennifer. I really appreciate it and looking forward to the next time we can get together. Same. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chris and Amy. We really appreciate um, every opportunity to have conversations with you guys. So Absolutely. Love the audience.
Yeah, thank yeah. you both for taking the time to present for us today. Um, I will mm -hmm. remind everybody that the recording of today's presentation and the slides will be available online, usually within about 24 to 48 hours of us wrapping up here. So uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you on the next webinar. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay.